Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to an event that I have been very excited for for a very long time. Uh, partly because, do I need to say this? It's a fantastic book, and we're going to hear some fantastic uh, presentations about it. Partly too, just to have people together in a room again. I mean, this feels partly like an event, partly like a party, because there's so many old friends I haven't seen in the flesh for so long. Let me start by thanking Paul Gray for paying for this reception and Rob Hutton for eating all the nuts, sadly. Uh, let me secondly say it is so, so nice that David Butler, who started this thing, <laughs> can be here with us this evening. Uh, let me thirdly say to those watching online that you can submit your questions on Slido, and when I've figured out what the passcode is for this iPad, I'll be able to see them. Uh, can I also say, seeing as we seem to have 30 questions already before we've started, it would be tremendously helpful if you could vote for the ones you want me to put to the panel, because I'm a populist at heart, and I'll go for the most popular questions. I was joking about the code, I know the code. <laughs> Have enormous faith at me, in me at work. Uh, but without further ado, let me introduce uh, this panel. I'll start with the academics. Uh, on my far left is Rob Ford from the, from the University of Manchester, who I hope his co-authors will agree did most of the heavy lifting to put this uh, volume together. <laughs> Next in line, uh, Paula Surridge from the University of Bristol. I should also say that the other editors, Tim Bale, uh, writers of this book, Tim Bale and uh, Will Jennings are there in the front row. Uh, to uh, Paula's right is Andrew Fisher, who was formerly Director of Policy at the Labour Party. To his right is Robert Colville, who wrote the 29th... Co-wrote. Co we'll get into which bits you didn't write and which bits you don't write. <laughs> uh, the 2019 Tory Manifesto. And next to me is Pippa Crer, our political editor of The Daily Mirror. The way this is going to work is both Rob and Paula are going to give presentations about the contents of the book. I'll come to the three panellists for brief comments, then I'll open it up for questions and discussion. So, Rob, over to you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm just going to bring my laptop with me so I can hide behind it. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a little bit daunting presenting in front of both David and Dennis Kavanagh. Um, two, two individuals associated uh, with this series for, for over 70 uh, years. Uh, to answer the most frequently asked question regarding the cover, yes, it was an easy decision which it is to use. The main competitor was a picture of Boris uh, with a giant fish uh, in Grimsby Fish Market. So it was either Pie Boris or Fishy Boris. In the end, we were Pie Boris. Uh, you can draw your own conclusions about our biases from that. Uh, before I get on to a little bit of the substance of the presentation, I just wanted to add to Alan's uh, tribute to, to David and Dennis. This is an extremely big honour for me. Uh, when I started as an undergraduate, David and Dennis's books were some of the first things that I read. Um, so it is both a huge privilege and slightly terrifying to now be presenting to them today. Uh, David had a 54-year tenure on this series. Uh, if I match that, I'll be 96. <laughs> <laughs> Not so long. Um, <laughs> so it's a great honour to have you both here, David and Dennis, and I hope you will not be too displeased uh, with what we've come up with. Uh, I wanted to start with a quote from the very first book, which David worked on as a research assistant in uh, 1945. Uh, the Duke of Wellington once observed that you can no more describe a battle than you can describe a ballroom. Still less, it might be said, can you describe a general election. Twenty or more million people give their votes under every variety of circumstances and from innumerable motives. One thing is certain about such an event as a general election, it is not simple. So I'm getting my excuses in early, if you don't <laughs> my interpretation. I only have ten minutes, so I'm going to focus on the role of the BBC in this election, that would be Boris, Brexit and Corbyn. Starting with Boris, and rewinding to the middle of 2019, following repeated catastrophic defeats of Theresa May's Brexit plan, many Conservative members and MPs have come to see the wisdom 
of Prince Falconeri in the Milan Medusa's classic, The Leopard. Unless we ourselves take a hand now, they'll force the Republic on us, or in this case, a second referendum. So if we want things to stay as they are, then things will have to change. And the particular and very precise mathematical formula of that change is illustrated very nicely in this cartoon from The Independent. Nigel Farage plus Corbyn in number 10 minus May's withdrawal agreement equals inevitably Boris. And for those who are wondering about the stability of the polls right now, it's worth remembering. <laughs> year or so of the 2017-19 Parliament featured very stable polling. Then round about the time that the withdrawal agreement started its uh, stuttering progress through the common, Commons, we started to see a major shift in polling. The Conservative Party collapsed, as we'll come on to the Labour Party collapsed too. Uh, and Nigel Farage's newly founded Brexit Party uh, played a key role in that. Dire local and European election results also underscored to the Conservatives the paramount need to win lead voters back. And the party membership had little doubt about who was best equipped for this task. And as you'll see from the second half of that graph at the end of 2019, it does seem that lead voters tended to agree with them. The Conservative rebound, which actually began a little bit before Johnson was formally elected as leader, was both immediate, substantial, and sustained, both in polling in terms of vote intention and polling in terms of leader ratings. You will see that Theresa May's leader ratings in the spring of 2019 were not great, uh, and there was an immediate 20 point jump in those leader ratings uh, after Johnson had been elected as uh, leader. Now, meanwhile, as you see from the second part of this graph, Labour had also been suffering a growing leadership problem. Corbyn's ratings, which had been amongst the best that he had received in the second half of 2017, went on a steady decline all the way through 2018 and 2019, and were pretty poor by the time the Conservatives were picking a new leader. And this, too, was a Brexit-related issue. In particular, the Conservatives sorry, Labour's persistent inability to unite behind a clear and credible Brexit policy was an issue that dogged the party through the whole parliament. But it's important to remember the structural problem that Labour faced during this period. Because on the one hand, there were a party whose voter base at that point, and whose activist, activist base emphatically, leant very heavily towards Remain. On the other hand, any analysis of the electoral battlefield on which a majority would be won or lost could not avoid the conclusion that it was a leave leading battlefield. Therefore, it followed that the party had to be able to offer something to leave voters as well as remain voters unless it was going to concede the case for a majority entirely. However, what was often a complex and indeed tortured internal debate was often rather simplistically framed to and by voters as simply evidence of an obstinate leader refusing to respect the will of his voters and his activists. As, for example, this Ben Jennings cartoon from around the time of the 2018 conference illustrates. The true story was a lot more complicated, but voter perceptions do also matter. To return to that graph, around about the same time as the Conservatives were facing a Brexit Party related polling breakdown, the Labour Party were facing a Liberal Democrat and Green Party related polling breakdown. Though not, as some might have anticipated in February 2019, a Change UK related polling. <laughs> change UK did not prove to be change that many people believed in in the uh, end. Now, Labour's solution to this problem throughout the Parliament was to attempt to offer something to everybody. Despite the pressure from the polling, there was really not much prospect of Labour changing its leader in 2019. 
But they did recognise the need to change the emphasis in their approach. But again, what they attempted to do was to offer something to both sides. With back the remain voters while still leaving the door open to leave voters. And that meant offering both to negotiate a new Brexit deal and committing to a second referendum on that deal. The problem was this offer of something for everyone, by this point in a very polarised climate, was not particularly warmly received by either side, and in particular ended up reinforcing by, uh, a by then entrenched narrative that Labour was obfuscating over Brexit, as for example this Chris Riddle cartoon illustrates. It is no wonder then that when we get to the election campaign itself, Priority number one for the Labour Party is to shift the focus of the campaign to domestic politics and domestic policy. The Labour Party in 2019 regarded the 2017 manifesto, big spending and radical, as one of the things that helped change the weather in that campaign. It is therefore no surprise that they attempted to up the ambition in 2019 by offering an even bigger and more radical manifesto. Yet while many of the individual policies hold very well in isolation, they were often not very well communicated as a package by what was often a disjointed campaign. And as any parent knows, if kids have too many Advent chocolates at Christmas, the cumulative effect will tend to be indigestion. The Conservatives, meanwhile, had a rather different approach. They first of all sought to neutralise Labour's domestic appeal with the promise of substantial extra cash for themselves. It's often forgotten now, given all that's happened since COVID, but the Conservative Manifesto of 2019 promised bigger spending increases than any Conservative leadership since Harold and Miller. At the same time, they had a ruthless focus on one particular message, which many of you may remember quite well. It was three words. One of them was Brexit, the others were two verbs. Uh, you might see it occasionally on some of their campaign material. Now, Labour were not, in fact, entirely unsuccessful in terms of shifting the agenda and voter attention. In particular, health, grade on here, gained a lot more attention by the end of the campaign for voters than it was getting at the beginning. And Brexit did go down somewhat. The problem was that voter attention to Brexit by the time of the election was so high and so hard to move that uh, this extra attention to domestic uh, issues was not enough. And in particular, there was also a second problem for the Labour Party, which was leader perceptions. Labour began 2019 further behind than they had begun in 2017. This was not because Boris Johnson was a popular leader. This idea of Boris Johnson as a kind of Heineken politician is true to some extent in terms of the disaggregated nature of this appeal, a particular part of the electoral way is popular. There are also particular parts of the electoral way is unpopular relative to the average Conservative. What was different was Corbyn. Johnson was behind May every single day of the 2019 election campaign. Uh, relative to May's ratings in 2017, but Corbyn was even further behind his, his former self throughout the campaign. And that, in the end, made a big difference to the outcome. It's also not true that nothing changed in the campaign. Instead, it was more like uh, one of those, I mean, it's the Nuffield study, so one of those Oxford Cambridge boat races where both sides are furiously paddling away, but they're not really changing their position relative to each other. Both Labour and the Conservatives gained substantial ground all the way through the campaign at the expense of the smaller parties. The Conservatives from the Brexit Party, Labour from the Liberal Democrats, but they gained at similar rates throughout, which meant that the horse race never really changed. And after two polling and campaigning surprises in a row, this was a return to the kind of traditional campaign that David and Dennis have written about in many of the parts of this party starts with a big lead, keeps the big lead, and the results on election night are much to the relief of some of the pollsters in this room, very much in line with what the polling on election day suggested 
like they would be. So we might ask whether or not this was a normal service resume. But there was one surprise on election night, and it was this. The much debated influence of Nigel Farage's Brexit party. Our analysis, or I should say particularly the analysis of Patrick English, who's here, Steve Bishop, who's here, and John Curtis, who sadly can't join us, suggests that Nigel Farage's Brexit party may have saved the Labour Party up to 25 seats and thus denied Boris Johnson's Conservatives a majority that could have potentially been north of 130. Uh, and indeed, the Hartlepool by election result really underlined that and indeed underlines one unusual challenge in the election to come, which is that even if there is an angle of national swing towards Labour in the next election, there is a set of seats whose current incumbents are only there because the leave vote was split heavily last time. It may not be as, as heavily next time. Which brings us on to the theme of the patterns in the vote, uh, for which I hand over to my co Paul. So I'm going to um, remember to use the clicker for a start and even get it the right way up. There we go. I'm going to pick up um, Rob's theme of BBC, Brexit, Boris and Corbyn. Um, but I'm going to do so through some of the individual analysis that's in the book, which is something of a innovation in the series. It wasn't to change what had already gone before, which was so fantastic, but to add to it and to add some um, depth to some of the uh, ideas about why voters voted as they did to supplement um, all the work on how the parties behaved. This, of course, was... I, I, I was just listening to a conversation between um, Will and David Butler there and talking about how the 1950s data was on punch cards. Well, we were certainly helped out by the fact that that's not how data is collected anymore. Um, and we were able to use um, some of the data from the election studies. We were also, in that sense, helped out by the pandemic because we were delayed a bit, which meant that we were delayed long enough for the data to have come out. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm warning you here um, that I'm going into the boring data bit, which I guess is going to divide this room into those people that are like, yes, bring it on, and those people that are just like, going, when are the drinks coming? Um, <laughs> So I want to start off with the really big picture, which this um, chart from the book illustrates, and that is the way in which Brexit on the surface seems to explain so much. The Leave vote really coalesced around one party, Conservatives getting 74% of that vote, whilst the Remain vote split. And this is a familiar story, not just in terms of Brexit, it's, it's a familiar story now um, in some of the polling as well. But you know that already. I'm not telling anybody in this room something new by telling you that. Why did that happen is the really interesting question, I think. And I'm going to um, leave you hanging on for a couple of minutes to find out the why answer, because I want to show you one or two other things, first of all. Because this is really a big picture. And what we were able to do by looking at the individual data was to go back in time um, for some things using the data that goes back to 2015, for some other things using data that went right back to 1979. So we were able to put the 2019 election into this really long-term context. Now, if you've been awake even once since the 2019 general election, you have probably heard of the Red Wall. <laughs> <coughs> This tracks the uh, share of the vote for Conservative and Labour in non-Red Wall seats, which are labelled as National and the Red Wall seats. And I want to make two points, really, about these charts. First of all, the gap between those lines, between the Red Wall seats and, and all the other seats, narrowed over this period. So this is the period from May 2015 to the 2019 general election. So the gap for the Conservatives in those seats was narrowing over that period. It narrowed to some extent in 2017. To some extent, Theresa May's election in 2017 was already knocking a few of those bricks out. And this wasn't just Boris sweeping everything in his wake in 2019. The other thing that I wanted to bring out from these charts, though, is the way that the lines, although they do narrow, they also move in very similar, in very similar patterns. 
We're not seeing here voters in the red wall behaving massively differently to voters everywhere else, and I think that's important as well. There's now so much talk about what will the red wall think of what I had for breakfast this morning um, that we forget that actually they're made up of voters that are pretty similar to the voters everywhere else, just in different quantities and different mixes. I'm really having trouble at this point of getting the wrong way up. I want to also just briefly introduce some of these longer term trends that we were able to um, unpack and stress that some of these things had been happening for quite a long time. It wasn't even just Theresa May loosening the bricks of the Red Wall in 2017. These things had been happening for a while. I'm not going to go into any of this in a lot of detail. You, you can read it in the book if you find any of these charts really interesting. But a couple of things. First of all, looking at generational divides. I think it's really interesting here to make that comparison with the period between 1997 and 2005. So the Labour lead over the Conservatives in, those two, in that period and in 2017, a little bit less so in 2019, was pretty similar amongst the under 45s. But in those earlier elections, in 1997-2001, they were also doing better amongst the over 45s. And it's that gap. You can see that from 2005 onwards, Labour fall behind in terms of the over 45s, and they never catch up. And they're still struggling to catch up in terms of that age group. Any of you who follow me on Twitter, and if you don't, why not, um, <laughs> will have seen this chart before. This chart um, places into a value space which has economic left and right along the horizontal axis and a liberal, uh, I'll call it authoritarian today, um, a liberal authoritarian scale on the vertical axis which makes a two-dimensional political space in which we can locate voters. And this shows how the average voter for each party has moved in this space over time. One of the things that I like to point out from this chart, I mean, you all know that the Labour Party support was moving down into that bottom left corner again. That's not telling you anything you didn't already know. But the thing I like to point out most from this chart is that the average Conservative voter in 2015, 2017 and 2019 was in the same place on the Liberal Authoritarian axis as the average Labour voter had been between 1992 and 2010. So to win back some of those voters is not necessarily meaning that you have to go right to the top of the chart. There's been a really interesting change there. Now I want to return back to the kind of script of Brexit, uh, Boris and Corbyn and show you two charts that unless you've read the book you won't, well, actually you won't have seen these versions at all because I've made them a bit bigger for the chart. These are models of people switching from Labour. So these are voters who switched from Labour to the Conservatives and it's the likelihood of different types of voters doing that, controlling for a whole bunch of demographics that for the sake of a presentation I took off the charts just to show you the important bits. If you want the full lot you can see them in the book. The really important thing here is to go back to that point about Boris Johnson as the Heineken leader, the Heineken, person, the Heineken prime minister who can reach the parts others can't. A key factor for people switching from Labour to Conservative was by far that they liked Boris Johnson. However, the reason they liked Boris Johnson was driven largely by Brexit because they thought he would get Brexit done. And I think that's an important thing for where we are in our politics right now. Because if that was what was driving this Heineken touch, that shine can come off if in fact Brexit isn't done or if in fact it's seen not to be done in the way that these voters would have liked. Note here that the low scores for Corbyn don't really drive this and demographics drive it even less. This was about a leader who could appeal to a particular group of voters. So not necessarily popular on aggregate, but able to reach across a divide and pull some voters across. I don't think, I think the jury is still out till the next election on how well he can then hold on to them. If we look at the other side of the um, Labour coin, so this is people who switched from Labour to a Remain party. So be that the Greens, the Lib Dems, most of them. The majority of switching Labour Lib Dem. Here we see something slightly different. The two big effects again are around party leaders, but here we see something that we might describe as a push factor. 
rather than a pull factor of really liking a particular leader. There is a very strong push factor from Labour to other Remain parties for those groups of voters who didn't like uh, Jeremy Corbyn for whatever reason. Now again, some of that might be driven by their perceptions. They might not have perceived him as Remain enough. It might have been driven by other factors that were going on in terms of um, his image at the time. But we can see the importance of leaders, particularly when we look down at these um, groups of vote switchers. And I'm aware we've got lots of other panellists to get on to, so I'm going to leave you just with that lovely image of the pie. <laughs> Thanks, both of you. The one thing I forgot to say at the start, if there are, I don't think there are, but if there are any shrinking violets in the audience and you want to put your question to the panellist via Slido, you can use that QR code. And it'll probably not work, but you can try it and see what happens. Uh, I'm just going to sort of turn to the three of you in a sense and ask you for your reflections, your recollections, whether what we've heard certain matches as you remember. I'm going to start with you, because you're heading on. Thank you. Um, this is fun for me. Um, <laughs> it, I have to say this book is, is incredibly well written. I, I have read it cover to cover. Um, and um, I also, as I did a politics undergraduate degree, was um, familiar with reading uh, David Butler and Dennis Kavanagh's books. They were all on my reading list um, as an undergraduate over 20 years ago. So um, it's really nice to be here. I would have preferred to be here for 2017. It was a bit more uplifting for me personally. but. Um, here we are. Um, I, there's nothing substantial in the book I disagree with, so I, mean, I just want to, I guess from a Labour perspective, just quickly elaborate a bit on Brexit, why not, because that's the, um, the key to this election, I think. And I think um, there are a number of, of factors of why and how we got things wrong, and perhaps also why we didn't get things as wrong as, as, uh, as others as well. Um, I think the key thing is, 2017 told us if we could shift the debate off of Brexit, we would beat the Tories, and that, you know, not beat the Tories, but do better against the Tories. Um, and that, I think, was a lesson that was true in 2017, but it probably wasn't a lesson that applied going forward, and that was a mistake in hindsight that I think we probably all internally, I don't think there were very few, if any, voices saying um, we shouldn't keep trying to do that. Um, it became impossible as things moved on, and we didn't uh, move with that, and that's a, a complete failure. I think the second thing is the internal politics of the Labour Party, which we kind of alluded to by Rob about how Remain biased our base was, whereas actually, um, and so were our voters, but not quite as much, and the electoral geography of Brexit meant most seats were leave in a way that often most voters were leave as well, hence they won the referendum in 2016, but to a much larger degree, uh, constituencies were leave, and that did uh, have an impact. Um, I think the, you know, the kind of brutally honest, it's a question of leadership as well, and, and leadership is something that I think comes naturally to people on different areas and different subjects. Um, it's quite easy to lead on things that are in your safe zone, um, but unfortunately when you're a leader you've got to lead on everything. Um, and there was probably a failure to, to give proper leadership on Brexit. Admittedly, I think that would have been difficult for any Labour leader given the fractiousness of the PLP at that time. Um, I'm sure some people can attest to that far more, um, in a far more detailed way than I could. Um, I guess the penultimate point I want to make, just very briefly as I run through this, is I don't think any, there's any kind of alternative Brexit policy Labour could have taken that would have substantially changed the result of the election. I don't think if we'd gone full hardcore Remain, that would have worked particularly. I think that probably would have turned off more of our voters in certain areas. And I think if we'd gone you know, full leave, I think we would have lost a lot more to the Lib Dems and the Greens. So I don't think, there might be marginal differences, 10 or 20 seats the other way, I expect other people could make a far more... Um, accurate guess at that, but I don't think substantially uh, that could have shifted that. I think the electoral geography of Brexit, plus the very long drawn out failure of May uh, to get Brexit done, if you like, um, meant that by the point the election came, there was just no no sort of policy we could have taken at that point to change things. Um, and the final thing I'll say, which is on a, a slight up point from, for Labour, I suppose, is that we weren't the only ones to get our tactics wildly wrong on Brexit. Um, obviously, Theresa May did. Um, the Liberal Democrats, I think, did. Uh, I think their revoke policy backfired massively. Um, uh, and I think the People's Vote campaign, by not trying to appeal to Leave voters and actually just becoming a kind of more hardcore remaining movement, really did backfire. And I think that did 
um, hinder labour as well. But we were, yeah, I'm not trying to shift the blame on that. I'm just saying I think those things uh, all contributed to the result that the Tories got. And, you know, as ever, the right's more disciplined than the left in British politics, unfortunately. And the right came back together. If, if you see Brexit, Brexit a, you know, or the Leave campaign certainly came back together, whether you see that distinctly as a right-left thing, that definitely overlaps. Mm. But there we are. So. Before, before we go to Robert, can I just ask you one thing, Andrew, which is something... Don't know, is it, <laughs> just the degree to which Change UK impacted on your thinking. I mean, you know, there was this theory that actually, forget their electoral performance, their impact on the policy of the Labour Party was a crucial impact they had that shaped British politics. Uh, no, I don't think it did, and I, I'll try not to be flippant about them, because it's easy to. Um, <laughs> but no, it didn't. I mean, our, our, our kind of membership base was very, very pro-Remain. The unions were shifting, I think, probably roughly 50-50, but slightly more coming towards Remain by the point of Labour Party conference. I don't think Change UK had any impact on that or on our membership. That was where it was, and I think they were the predominant things. I don't think that did have an effect. I guess where you could say it might do, I think the fear of further defections mm -hmm. around that issue might have done, but I don't think that was driven by Change UK, because I don't think we ever thought they were going to be the pole of attraction, because if you like, it wasn't the substantial figures within the party that left to form Change UK by and large. Um, maybe that's a bit, I don't mean that mean, in a mean way to anybody you know, who shifted, but um, I hope I do. Um, but, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't think that was the. I don't think anybody thought Change UK is going to take off at any point. Was that enough? Think okay. that we must shift because of the, this great electoral force that is coming. That was never a fact. I don't think. Thank you, Robert. Happier memories. <laughs> yeah. Although um, the idea that I'm sitting here as a spokesman for the Conservative campaign is utterly ludicrous, given that Isaac Levido is in the room. <laughs> I mean, um, um, like you know, Isaac, I, Isaac and Michael Brooks were the were the engine that drove the the Tory campaign. Um, even within the manifesto team, but the, 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 the line I use is that, um, is that Rachel Wolf and Manira Merza were the architects of the manifesto, and I was the interior decorator who was brought in to make it all look pretty once they'd actually uh, done the construction work. Um, so I'm not saying this with any claim, claim, claim to authorship or ownership. I mean, look, even James, you know, James actually kind of came up with the phrase red wall, like, who am I to, uh, um, to say? That said, I, I think my, 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 my view on this, like, the seeds of 2019 are so very much sown in 2017, and the, the, the line I've used before is that it taught the Labour Party to lose and it taught the Tory Party to win. It taught the Labour Party that, that a one more heave strategy could, could work, and, but it taught the Tory Party that, oh dear, we're in a lot of trouble here. Um, I, I'm very pleased to see you using the BBC um, uh, analogy, because I, I think I have a claim to being, I mean, it's probably like, it's, it's a really fairly obvious line, but I, I, I definitely came up with it like independently and was probably one of the first people to use it. But um, I remember sitting in an autopsy, uh, like a kind of, um, like a sort of cons very, very, very depressed conservative meeting, much like the ones I imagine you had after 2019, after 2017. And I made the case for optimism and said, look, it's not like, it is inconceivable the Conservative Party will, will go into another election with a manifesto that actively punches their key voters in the, fa their the face, cutting spending on schools and launching a, you know, a vast protest movement among head teachers on that, a, a robotically incompetent leader who can only say like two words in the English language, a campaign team which is divided against itself where no one is sure who is in charge, a, 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 an election you have voluntarily called telling the British people you need this to save Brexit and you've produced absolutely no evidence that you need this election to save Brexit. I mean, there's, there's literally like eight or nine or ten things that you can say the Tories did absolutely catastrophically wrong in that campaign. And they still actually, you know, won the election, um, even though it felt like they'd lost it and it felt to the Labour Party like they'd won it. And, you know, we, we have a tendency, I think, to analyse elections, in, especially, 20, especially 17, 19, because of this, this dramatic change in the Labour vote. We, you know, generally speaking, it's governments that win elections and lose them. Um, it's, you know, it's not oppositions. And I think, in a weird way, I mean, all, with the exception of this book, which is, it is very, very, very good and very, very solid, I mean, but generally the conversation about the electro election has focused more on Labour than the Conservatives, in, in, in a weird way. So, I mean, I think, obviously, all the fundamentals you've identified in the book are completely right. Um, I would say, I think that Isaac and co. ran a better campaign than Labour. They had much less ammunition. 
uh, partly because um, Sajid Javid in particular was determined to keep clear blue fiscal water and uh, prevent the Tories from being, you know, from, prevent the Tories from getting into a spending competition with Labour because you could never win that. But the, the discipline on um, get Brexit done was insane. I mean, I, we all remember Boris at the debate being asked, what, what would you give Jeremy Corbyn for Christmas? And his answer was a copy of my Brexit deal. And Boris could get away with that in a way, because of that kind of knowing, no wink in his eye in a way that, that, that Theresa May um, never could. But, um, so I, you know, I think that's, you know, and by, by contrast, I mean, the book draws this out quite well. I mean, you know, with Labour, you have the manifesto being launched and then, you know, even like a couple of days later, you have a random pledge to spend tens of billions of pounds on the Waspies dropping in fr fr from nowhere. I mean, you know, the, 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 the Tory manifesto, I think, and the Tory campaign in general were all kind of conceived and designed and executed as part of a single seamless plan and a single seamless message. And it was quite a boring one, get Brexit done. And like we and we're not going to let and we're not going to you know screw up anything else and we'll, we'll we'll spend quite a lot of money on GPs and nurses and all literally all of the things that you that focus groups tell us you like I mean I, I, I mean, there was a, I think the Huffington Post did a focus group during a campaign and they published it saying you know, these are the things voters were interested in and it was literally it was not just the policies that were in the Conservative manifesto it was the order they were in them it was like we quite like more GPs tick we quite like more nurses tick we quite like potholes fixed tick you know it was very you know. I think I think it's just very 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 well done, um, and um, I think it, w it will be interesting to see how, how that plays out. But I think we can also like overestimate the, the differences between seventeen and nineteen. Like one of the, like I mean Andrew will obviously disagree with this, but like the seventeen manifesto from Labour was not fully costed. It said the words fully costed, but like it was as open to attack as the 2019 manifesto on many fronts. It's just Jeremy Corbyn was more popular. He had like, a freshness to him. People were, were more interested. Like, you know, there wasn't the interest in, like, there wasn't the feeling that, oh, these guys could be the government. We better really scrutinize this in the way that, that there was in 19. And, and the, but the point made about Boris appealing to certain voters, I mean, the, the picture you've chosen is obviously of him, um, you know, him, him in, the, in the, one of the many pictures on the campaign trail of him beaming with Get Brexit Done. The, the one that always sticks in my mind is, and ended up on the back cover of the manifesto and almost ended up on the front cover, was of a group of, a group of industrial workers at a site he'd been to holding a homemade sign saying, basically, we love you, Boris. And like those were the those were if like if you could just if if like if if Isaac had like a group of voters on his pin board that he wanted to be holding those signs, it was those guys. And when that photo came in on, on, on the wires, I think there was a general sense that yeah, oh yeah, this is this is really working. This is there is something happening here. But obviously everyone was still utterly terrified because of 2017. That um and just felt I mean I, I certainly like no one could believe the polls because like it had been such a surprise last time that you know, when it when they actually were validated it was like such a yeah an incredible shock anyway for me at least thank you robert do feel free to start the hashtag it was robert what won it <laughs> that could be fun pippa well i um thanks on that i mean i think this i thought it was a brilliant book but i have to be honest i kind of got heart palpitations reading it again because that general election campaign i mean it's bad enough for the parties but as journalists that are expected to um to really that back a bit maybe right. um as journalists that are expected to follow both party all parties around uh, dashing you know here and two across the country and um uh, it had some, you may have been trying to run a boring campaign, but it wasn't anything like that for us. Um, we, um, you know, Boris driving bulldozers through <laughs> polystyrene bricks and, um, and uh, the mirror being chucked off the Tory election bus, um, an increasingly belligerent Tory campaign, and then following Jeremy Corbyn round um, in his bus, uh, what felt like he was getting as increasingly miserable as the campaign progressed, as the weather was, as the winter progressed. Um, so there was a real sort of contrast between the two campaigns there as a, from a journalist's perspective. Um, I'm afraid I'm also a classic journalist in that while it was fascinating to look through all the tables and all the analysis, I also inevitably thought, what does this mean for the future? And it's, well, while Robert and, and Andrew have talked a bit about sort of 27 and 2019, what I'm really interested in is what 2019 means for what comes next. And both in terms of governing over the next four or five years, but also 
uh, or next few years, um, uh, but also uh, what happens at, at next election. I mean, it's a terrible journalist failing all this to be fascinated as much by the politics of an election as by the governance in between times. Um, so Brexit obviously dominated um, the last election. I don't need to repeat any of that, but what I'm interested in is how will it play in the next election? Of course, a lot of that um, depends on how um, how the next the next uh, few months play out with renegotiations of deals, uh, threats of Article 16, and how much Brexit remains in the public consciousness. You kind of suspect that Boris Johnson will quite be quite happy to either have a fight with the EU in the run-up to the next election, or indeed to say it's all done, delivered and dusted. Um, whereas Labour, on the other hand, will be desperate not to talk about it uh, for, for all the reasons we've seen in as many slides and cartoons um, above us. Um, so Brexit and how much of a factor that will be is clearly important. Leadership, which um, the book goes into great depth on, uh, was also clearly important. And it's not Boris Johnson versus Jeremy Corbyn next time, it's Boris Johnson versus probably Keir Starmer um, next time. And how those different characters, Keir Starmer has obviously made um, a huge play to bring the Labour Party back towards the centre, to try and reconnect with some of the Brexit voters that he felt, and not just Brexit voters, but voters in the sort of traditional, uh, traditional Labour base that he felt that they disconnected from. Will that be successful? We don't, we don't know yet. I mean, it, it looks in incredibly difficult, uh, almost impossible, I'd say, for Labour to be able to be in position at the next election to win a majority. What you could conceive ha happening, if things go badly for the government, and I agree with you that it's, it's governments that win and lose elections rather than oppositions that win them, is that um, he, they get into a position where they're, they're relying on support of other parties and able to, to be able to form some sort of government. Um, but I think delivery will be key to whether the government is regarded as a success or not. It's, obviously, it's Boris Johnson's leadership, it's also delivery, and we don't know what's going to happen with Brexit yet, although he can say, um, you know, for the vast majority of the public, I think they, they regard Brexit as having been done, uh, whether they agree with it or not, and whether they think it's a good Brexit or not is a different matter. Um, and. But the, the second sort of big area that many promises were made uh, was, was so-called levelling up agenda, and that's dominated a lot of what we think and write about now. Um, and the problem for the government, of course, is that such, that is such an amorphous beast. What does it actually mean? Michael Gove's come the closest I've seen to be able to define what it means. But the problem with not knowing, not being able to define it means that it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And if you're a particular voter who, who, has, who has backed... Uh, the Conservatives at the last election because you think that they're going to make your life better what, in, in whichever way, whether it's more GPs or whether it's your high street looking nice or whether it's better rail transport to your nearest city and that doesn't happen all the excuses about we've had a pandemic and there's been a massive financial impact they don't fall away but, that, but you know, it, it lessens the, the sort of the it lessens the argument if you like um, so I think the key things are what Boris Johnson does, Brexit, delivery, um, and then after that, when you get closer to the election, clearly the opposition needs to have a plan and some policies. I think the problem now is that not only, I can accept the argument of, of Labour saying you know, we don't need policies, detailed policies at this point, but I think people don't know, I don't think people know sort of the get what the, the principles, if you like, the sort of the broader thrust of, of Keir Starmer's Labour Party is about, and I think that's a problem for them they need to address. Um, I'm moving on well from the book now, aren't I? So I better, I better wrap up. But um, one thing I did wonder, when you were talking about the picture on the front cover, and which a lot of us in the lobby have been talking about, is how did he hold the dish if it was a, 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 an oven, you know, just like the oven? Is it, is it just, is it in the oven? It's, it's oven ready. It's, it's oven ready. ready. Right, fine, okay, it's nice. <laughs> the, 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 the metaphors around the deal um, expanded and mutated over the course of the year. <laughs> Thank. I mean, I, I feel well. I, let me say two things. One, for those watching online, I'm sorry for the problems with streaming and volume, and I will try and come. To, I'm going to ask a few of these online questions just out of a sense of guilt because apparently this is our first live event for it feels like a hundred years. So you know, teething problems. 
but I want to give Paula and Rob a chance, if they want it, I suppose, to address Pippa's implicit question, which is, can we learn things about from what you found about the 29 election that are of use thinking forward? If you were a political party, if you wanted to say, from this book, I would, I would learn the following lessons if I were Labour or the Conservatives. You look, both look very angry with me for asking this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, but you can pass if you want, or phone a friend. Or... Uh, no, I, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll give it a go. Um, I think, I mean, I, th I think it's right to look forward as well as to look backward. I mean, obviously these books are backward-looking, but the lessons are going to be forward-looking. I mean, I think one big overarching theme when thinking about the, the massive importance of Brexit in this election is the importance of remembering that Brexit is not just a policy these days. It's not even an outcome. It's a state of mind. It's a tribal affiliation. And those of us who research electoral psychology have noted that it's a more widely held form of tribal affiliation than anything we've seen since the era when David started writing these books in the 1950s. Something like four out of every five voters in the electorate can and do spontaneously give a leave or remain affiliation. And one of the really big questions about the next general election is what happens to that psychology. There is no precedent for it in, in mainland British political history. There is a precedent for a party system built around arguments over a constitutional treaty in the Republic of Ireland and indeed in the North of Ireland too, which are illustrations incidentally of how those arguments can last a very long time in the minds of voters. But we don't know how English voters, Welsh voters, even Scottish voters will think of Brexit now that Brexit is in some sense done, or some phases of Brexit are done. Will that fade away? In which case, many of the traditional issues can fill that void. Or will it persist as a force that both sides can repeatedly reactivate? To me, that's probably the biggest question the next election turns on. Cheers. Paul, do you want to add anything? I think I'll just add one thing, if that's okay. So I would, I would just add that that tribalism cross cut with existing party identities or identities of other political identities of other kinds means that the electorate is very volatile i mean you saw that chart <laughs> that rob put up at the start so i think at the moment looking at a poll and saying this is where we think i mean i, I don't think it's telling you much about the next election because the electorate are so so volatile and that should be hope for parties that did less well in 2019 and a warning to those that did well that all of this can change very, very quickly and I don't think anything is set in stone for 2022, 3, 4, whenever it, whenever it comes. That's great, four, thank please. you. 24, please. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I've, I've, been, I've been asked to ask all panellists to speak louder and nearer the microphones because there are apparently some problems with the sound online. I'm going to, I think, alternate between questions from the room and questions online and Rosie's waving at me. No shrinking. Do you want to wait for a... Certainly. No shrinking violet here. I was desperate to get my question in because I was listening to you all and I was just thinking to myself, when I did my PhD 20 odd years ago, people said gender and voting, who gives the monkeys, it's not important. 2017, 2019, first elections in the whole post-World War period when a greater proportion of women than men voted for the Labour Party and a greater proportion of men than women voted for the Conservative Party. It is massive. Why are we not talking about it? Why don't we read about it in the newspapers? I'm just intrigued. What's going on? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to put that to Rob and Paul uh, in a sec, but I suppose I'd, I'd ask Robert and Andrew first of all, do you think in those two, do you sort of have a, a strategy for targeting men or a strategy for targeting women? Is that, is that the way you thought as you approached this election? Uh, certainly in the run-up to 2017, we did. Um, and uh, it was one of the things that I think came out of 2015 was that, if I remember rightly, it was more marginal, but it was still majority men in 2015. Is that right? No statistical significance between men and women. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that didn't chime with our our impression and I remember in the 2015 leadership election Jeremy Corbyn actually did very well amongst women both internally and his view, views of women of him in the public as well and 
So we were conscious of that. I mean, I can't honestly recall what we, I mean, there were obviously policies that we put in the 2017 manifesto that probably did appeal more to women. I can't remember the breakdowns on those. I mean, it's a long while back. Um, we would have looked at a lot of polling analysis, but it was certainly something that I remember us doing. I mean, I wasn't part of the kind of team that targeted different bits of the electorate, but we did have distinct policies that we knew played better with those, and we'd polled policies in the run-up to the 2017 election probably a lot more effectively, well, definitely a lot more effectively than we did in 2019, um, and did know where we kind of had policies that resonated with particular groups um, of the electorate and demographics. I can't remember off the top of my head what they were, but it definitely was something that was more of a conscious thing in 2017 than 2019, certainly. You did equally well in 2019. Amongst women, yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Yeah. Which, if you look at the under 50s, is massive. It's not in the newspapers, there's a lot of people here, I just don't know why. It's curious. Robert, it's interesting. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think there's a, with, with all respect, I think there's a fairly simple explanation for why that gender gap existed, which is Brexit and Boris. Like Brexit, I'm sorry, I was just looking at my phone. Brexit, the leave vote is 55% male, 49% female, so there's a gap there. And Boris has, you know, for reasons we can all think about, um, it has historically been more popular with, with men than women. So if you put those. Same gap in 2017 and 2019. Exactly the same. 12% points advantage, Labour amongst women. Massive. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, th th there, is, there are obviously policies you put in place to try and address that. But, but, I mean, I never got the impression that it was being done in order to close a particular gap. It was more that, you know, we knew childcare was a huge issue, partly because most of us writing, you know, working on the policies had kids. And, uh, you know, we were, we were sort of bleeding out of our wallets every time we, uh, every time we had to, to find somewhere for them to, to, to someone to look after them. Um, so it's... Um, uh, I, I, no, so I, I think you know, childcare is and things like that are obviously a huge part of the policy mix. But actually, one one interesting thing ab about that is there was a, there was a philosophical debate within the Tory campaign as to whether you then produced separate sort of mini manifestos like these are our policies for women, these are our policies for ethnic minorities, these are our policies for Scots. These are our you know, well, I mean, you obviously had a Scottish and Welsh manifesto separately, but there, there was a, there was a debate as to whether you salami, salami sliced the electorate or whether you said we're the Conservative Party, we st we we are a one nation party, we are, our policies appeal to everyone, we don't need to to break this to break this down. But your idea of the left behind voters is being masculinised, and if you think of that typical vote the average voter. More of an electorate of women, the average voters of women, the most economically marginalised in this country are women. If you want to win the next election, remember. Well, obviously, I'm a journalist now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let Pippa have a go, then I'm going to turn um, to you two for the definitive answer. I'm not, I'm not, well, it's more posing a question, really, but taking on from what you're saying. I mean, Boris Johnson, it seems to me, has a woman problem, and I don't mean that sort of woman problem. <laughs> um, but, I mean, these two at the end, are the experts really probably explaining women in, in, in that. And because it does, I mean, he does, he outpolls, he, he, he polls better among men than women in terms of leadership, doesn't he? What do you, what do you put that down to? Is it sort of the macho, is it is the Brexit, um, the Brexit's, uh, the sort of male, female Brexit divide, is it sort of the slightly macho approach he has? Is it the fact that he lies on the floor I don't know, we just press ups or whatever, and women just go, that's ridiculous, or... So although that is true for Boris, I think we need to take Rosie's point seriously that the divide was just as big in 2017, so it isn't as simple as that. Um, and I think there are lots of structural things that underpin it, and more typical academic response, sorry, but more, more work needed to get at those structural things because we've, amongst the under 50s we've got more women graduates now than we've got male graduates, for example. Um, we've got more women employed in public sector organisations than in private sector organisations. So I think we need to, to understand that better and I think it has been one of the missed, one of the missed stories um, of those last two elections. I'm sorry, that's a very academic answer. <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd offer um, one thought on this, uh, which reflects my own sort of academic uh, biography. Uh, so in uh, Revolt on the Right, uh, still available in all good bookstores at a very reasonable price, uh, we, we looked at the UKIP uh, electorate, uh, and the UKIP electorate uh, showed a distinctly male tendency, uh, which you also find with pretty much every radical right party. Uh, in Western Europe. And indeed, that kind of constellation of politics 
nationalistic, assertive, sceptical of immigration, culturally conservative, quite authoritarian, all tends to skew quite male. And I suspect one of the reasons that Boris has a women problem uh, is, is down to the fact that he has become a vehicle in part for that kind of politics. So it's not necessarily about him as an individual, but more about the kind of politics that he has successfully channeled into the Conservative Party from a quite distinct previous political tradition. Thank you. Just to say, if any of the, or so if Alan or Tim or Will or Dennis want to pipe in at desperately at some point, just worry about me. It's one of those few events of the year when we can be unashamedly academics and prioritise academics over everyone else. Uh, and I will come to you in a minute, Barry. I've just got, I just want to start on some of these questions from online. And the first, there's a whole load of things about progressive alliance. And I suppose, let me boil them down to the two things. Is, it, is one necessary for Labour to win and is one likely? And I've paraphrased dreadfully. I apologise to those online yet again for letting you down. Is one, is one necessary for Labour to win? No. Is one likely? No. Um, <laughs> I think that comes I like. <laughs> Andrew, do you want to... I feel I ought to... <laughs> Let you say something on this. Hell no. Um, <laughs> no I, I agree with Rob. Um, no, I don't think it is. Um, I, I think there will be probably a bit more ruthlessness going forward from people who see themselves as not Tories. Um, I would think probably at the next election than there was at the last. I think the last election, whilst Brexit, I think will endure as an issue. I don't think, I mean, who knows what will happen, um, but I doubt the next election will be as focused around Brexit and so I suspect um, uh, that kind of, uh, I think the domestic agenda will matter more and I suspect people will naturally be a bit more tactical about how they vote and, and do that anyway, um, whereas I think a lot of emotion and kind of ideal Brexit outcome was driving people's vote in 2019. Um, and I don't think it's feasible because there's just too much tribalism in all the main parties, so no, I think there's the reality, whether that's good, bad or indifferent. Um, that's a, just to, to chip in, one really good point John Curtis has made is that the, the Tories are now basically uncoalitionable, which is a sort of awkward phrase, but like, um, you know, thank, thanks partly to the Northern Ireland deal, there's, there's probably no one left who signs up with them uh, in, a, in a hung parliament situ situation, unless, unless you know, something quite spectacular is, is put on the table. It's much more likely for SNP, Lib Dems, Greens um, and, you know, to, um, to hook up with Labour. Anyone else want to come in on? Paul? Just briefly, because I don't, I don't feel like we've, we've mentioned the Lib Dems quite enough. So, um, one of the things that we saw in, in the analysis, and, and I'm sure other people have seen it as well, was the effect on Remain-leaning Conservative voters of um, the direction the Labour Party took in 2019, and a lot of those Remain-leaning Conservative voters were more concerned about the Corbyn government than they were about Brexit, so it kept those um, Lib Dems in the Conservative column, if I can put it like that. And obviously we're in a different position now, so those voters might be more willing to consider um, voting for the Lib Dems. And I think if you then put a progressive, a very formal progressive alliance um, over the top of that, it could, it could turn those voters off again and actually play against what that progressive alliance would be trying to achieve. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I'd absolutely agree with that. Um, I think it has to be informal, and I think we've seen it already with some of the by-elections we've had. Um, and I was talking to Labour and Lib Dem politicians uh, in recent days about North Shropshire and the Bexley by-election, both of which it's likely the Conservatives will win, but nevertheless, you never know. Um, and they, while there has not been any formal talks, there is very much a sort of a, well, we're not trying that hard in the seats, that, you know, in the opposite seat um, to, give, to give the other party a boost. Um, voters don't like being told what to do, but as we saw in Chesham and Amersham, they're more than capable of taking matters into their own hands and, uh, you know, delivering their own verdict. So I think it's more likely to be that than anything formal. Okay, I'm delighted to say that the Slido is no longer dominated by people saying, God, you're rubbish, I can't hear or see a thing, I'm going to have my tea. <laughs> We're getting some more questions on there. I'll come back to them in a sec, but I'll take two from the room. Barry's been waving me and Jack over there. So if you do it in that order, if you can keep them short and wait for the microphone, so everyone online can hear. Yeah, uh, you've talked mainly about Brexit for understandable reasons. Um, 
certainly the question, apart from Brexit, that seemed to dominate 2019 was anti-Semitism. And I wondered what your research had showed about the willingness of people to vote Labour or their unwillingness um, because of the way in which anti-Semitism played into the campaign. Jack, um, I'll get you the mic. This taking two questions is a silly idea in retrospect because the mic's got to yeah. yeah, but you better wait for the mic because because I'm deaf. Cheers. A question for Andrew, really. And well done for turning up and doing this, mate. Sorry to pile it on a bit, but why was the Labour campaign so much more dysfunctional in 2019 than it happened in 2017? And how much difference do you think that actually made in the end? Sorry about this, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> should we do the? Should we do Barry's question first? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the easy one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I mean, having just plugged my own past research, um, I'd now like to plug the research of one of my PhD students on this, this point. Uh, I've been very lucky to supervise uh, Andrew Barclay, who, whose whole PhD thesis was essentially investigating uh, the issue of uh, Jewish voting, and uh, he did a whole chapter on the role of anti-Semitism uh, in terms of Jewish labor support. Uh, and what he found pretty consistently was that there was a pretty substantial effect uh, of attitudes towards Corbyn on Jewish voting, which was not evident before Corbyn became leader, and a fairly sustained fall in Jewish support for Labour. Now, of course, because the Jewish community is not very large, much of the effect of anti-Semitism on Labour support would likely not come through that community, it's fair to say. The difficulty is, it's one of those things which very frustratingly if you're a researcher is very hard to pin down specifically in terms of measures. So I think it's quite likely a contribution to the lower ratings that Corbyn got. I know that in the analysis of the focus groups that we did, we gathered together all the focus groups that were publicly available, that issues uh, of anti-Semitism came up quite a lot in those, but it's very hard to quantify. Uh, it was definitely there as an issue, obviously it came up in the campaign too, and it was definitely a quantifiable and substantial effect on, on the Jewish community itself. Uh, more broadly, it's, it's harder to know for sure. Andrew, your time has come. <laughs> You want me to answer the Jack's question or on that one? Still? Well, I think you, sh you should answer Jack's question. If you want to answer the other one as well, um, that's great. Yeah, on anti Semitism, I mean, I, obviously I don't have any more data than, than Rob, in fact, probably considerably less, but um, I, I think it's quite evident, obviously, if you look to London, you know, which is the bit of the country I know best, clearly Labour does very well in London. In Barnet, that's not been the case, and that's fairly for fairly obvious reasons. Um, I think the Probably the bigger effect, just because, as Rob said, the you know the size of the Jewish community and its concentration in particular seats um, means electorally um, it's not that influential. But I think the issue of it both toxified Labour and I think also I think had a deeply personal effect on Jeremy Corbyn, and I think that's been fairly obvious. I think his um, lack of ability to perform in the way he did in 2017, which I think impressed a lot of people, I think was down to his. I think personal anguish at, at, at dealing with it, and I think he found it almost impossible to deal with. I think he found it completely, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, I'm speaking for him, aren't I? But I mean, I, I think he found it almost unfathomable that people would think he's an anti-Semite and found it very, very hard to deal with on a personal level. And I think that did um, mean he shut down very badly, like in that Andrew Neil interview, which um, I think, you know, there's a definite car crash as interviews go politically. Um, you know, it's not a great revelation to say that, is it? Um, it was bad, you know, and uh, so yeah, I think it did have an effect. On the on the on the sort of you know lighter topic of Jack's question, um, <laughs> this is this is the real fun bit. I assume there'll be a, a more varied range of questions later on. <laughs> um, why why was Labour's campaign more dysfunctional in 2019? Um, I think there. I think it was the issue of Brexit, which kind of I alluded to at the beginning. I said, you know, about leadership being you've got to be definitive and lead on everything, not just the things you like. And I think there was a bit of a vacuum at the top, um, a deliberate vacuum as well, in some senses a, a chosen vacuum around uh, Brexit because the party was so divided, both tactically about how to deal with the issue, but also. 
um, removed from a lot of its base um, and it's a lot of, uh, removed from a lot of the voters it needed to win in order to advance on 2017, as, as ridiculous as that sounds, given where we are now. Um, and that was part of it. I think there was a level of exhaustion uh, as well. Um, but I think structurally, a lot of people knew it was very difficult to overcome that and we didn't have the right policy in place. I, don't, I mean, I'm sceptical there is the right policy in place to have overcome the, the demographics of Brexit anyway for Labour in that election. But uh, I think when you're losing, it's easier to be dysfunctional, as I think the Conservatives or, you know, were more so in 2017. Obviously, they didn't lose. But, um, you know, they were... Uh, when things start going badly, you don't perform as well, and there tends to be, you know, a less optimistic, upbeat thing, whereas... In 2017, we started off quite determined to turn things around, believe it or not, from a very bad position. I think we were 25 points behind on a YouGov poll the day May called the election. And there was a determination to put that right and a kind of unity within a core group that had been through quite a lot in the last couple of years by that point to do that. I think by 2019, that wasn't the case. Uh, I also think there was a lack of... I mean, it was interesting, because obviously you don't see this when you're working on the campaign. Inside the Conservative campaign, this very clear sense of leadership and who's in charge of the campaign and people stepping back who shouldn't have been involved in the campaign. You know, Dominic Cummings, for example, and you mentioned as well, Robert, that didn't happen in the Labour campaign. Um, you know, I, I found it impossible to know who was in charge and who was finally, finally taking decisions, and I'm, I was an executive director of the party. So, you know, um, it, there's no disputing it was dysfunctional I, I, yeah, at all. Um, it was. Um, was that different from 2017? Totally different. Totally different, yeah. Does anyone else want to come on either of these issues? No, I've, I've got a question uh, from the Slido, which is, well, we've got a whole host of questions that are going to summarise as how important was social media in this election? And I don't, I mean, we can ask that in one of two ways. Either if you have data and want to talk about it, Rob and Paul, that's great. Or for uh, Andrew and Rob, to what extent or how much effort you put into your social media campaigns and what sense you have of how effective they were? And Pippa, just as a journalist observing, if you have any thoughts as well. Uh, I, mean, I, I just want to say two very brief things on this topic. The, the, the first is, I think the only previous author that I've not paid tribute to in all of this is Philip Cowley. So I'd like to cite one of Cowley's laws of elections, if I may, which is that the importance of a campaigning technique is inversely proportional to the amount of attention that people pay to it. <laughs> so... On that basis, one would make the prediction that social media mattered not very much and that things like leafleting mattered a great deal um, because social media is what everyone pays attention to. The second thing I would say is I think if there was one thing about this book that I would have liked to have done better, it's to analyse the influence of social media because, to be honest, I'm not really an expert on it and speaking to some of the people in the parties who were experts on it, I really felt a bit lost. So I'm still not 100% sure myself. Uh, it's certainly the case that there was a lot of really interesting stuff going on on it. I'm sceptical about its impact because of Cowley's law, but I don't know for sure. Send Cowley to Hong Kong and he still haunts a room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Robert and Andrew, do, do, do either of you want to reflect on, on how much attention you paid to social media and how key you thought it was? Well, I, I obviously pay an enormous amount of attention to social media because I'm a uh, think tank journalist, uh, social media addict. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I think generally, I mean, I, Isaac was pretty good about telling everyone just like, you know, ignore, ignore the, ignore all of the kind of the froth and the fuss and just like, just stick, stick to the message. That said, the, um, the Tories did, did have a wonderful line, uh, which I'm sure many people remember in, um, Apologies for language. Um, shit posting, um, basically just putting out content, which was so like so like I think the, like the top Hungarian kind of uh, stuff, which was so kind of so so, so deliberately awkward or uh, provocative that people would re like people would retweet it, like the um, you know the um, the lo-fi Boris wave thing of like picture of him in a sort of uh, in a railway carriage with with sort of um, trance-like music playing in the background, or or as we saw earlier, putting out posters in Comic Sans so that you get uh, you know a few thousand people retweeting you, going this is in Comic Sans, you you in bastards therefore amplifying the amplifying the, the message I mean one of the things I find most interesting about actually the last two elections is that we seemed we were heading for an age where everyone was telling us that micro targeting was very important and there's all this attention to pay to you know Cambridge Analytica and you know um, you know if you can just identify a few segments of the electorate and you know, target 
specifically honed messages at them. And actually, what we've had since that became popular is wave elections. We've had, you know, the, the, there doesn't seem to be much of a not just with social media. There doesn't seem to be that much of a correlation between where parties put their resources and the, the national result. Unless, I mean, others may others may disagree on this. Obviously, you, you know, you, you need to prioritize where you put your resources. But it feels like there there have been great, great big currents happening in the last few elections, which kind of swamp all of those all, all of those efforts. And it's one of the fascinating things is whether that continues or whether we do go to back as kind of normality returns to a more piecemeal kind of kind of world in which you can pick out certain regions. You know, like the, the classic example would be like picking off the Lib Dems in the Southwest in 2015, which was just a wonderful kind of um, ambush operation. Can I just... Yeah, of course you can. So I just, just wanted to add to the, to, the, to, the, to the question, really, that... As soon as we mention social media in this room, everybody's thinking Twitter. But if you mention social media to people who are not hugely politically engaged, they're not thinking Twitter, they're thinking Facebook, Instagram, and so on. And they're thinking pictures of cakes, really, rather than politics. So I think, that's, uh, I think we have our own biases in that really baked in. in that as, as soon as that question was asked, I guarantee everybody in this room thought of Twitter. But that probably wasn't where most of the mm -hmm. impact of political campaigns in the election actually happened. Um, and a lot of it's quite invisible. It's one of the reasons we don't analyse it in the book, because it's not easy to get into every single local spotted, you know, spotted in... I actually happen to live in an estate called Kingsway, so I'm kind of a bit confused as to where I am. But you see those kind of spotted in groups, and you can't... It's really hard to analyse those in an academic, rigorous way because they are all invisible, um, but they're really influential in terms of the, the sense people pick up of their communities. Um, so I just wanted to add that really to, to the question to mm. think a bit broader than, than just about Twitter. I, have to say, I thought of Snapchat because I've got irritating children, but... And, and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, well, thankfully, my children are too young for um, <laughs> social media yet. Um, although their time will come, no doubt, and it will be something I've never heard of by the time they're on it, I'm sure. Um, look, the, the actual guru of, of Labour's um, successful social media is in the room, a guy called Jack Bond, who's sitting over there. I'm going to embarrass him and say it. But um, he was incredible in the 2017 campaign and, and in the 2019 campaign, although obviously um, all thoughts for that don't belong to him at all. Um, what was interesting in the book, I think, um, where, you know, to be fair, Rob, you did analyse, I mean, I don't know who within your group did it, but, you know, whoever did, um, I thought it was quite interesting how the Conservatives focused on Google and YouTube um, far more um, than Facebook even and, and Twitter, um, obviously, which is obsessed for by journalists and, yeah. and you know, politicos like us, but actually isn't read by much of the normal public. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. But I think for us, um, and I'm sure people will correct me, I think we found it quite useful in engaging younger people and in driving younger age turnout in 2017 especially, which did have an impact in boosting our vote because it did engage with voters who perhaps hadn't been before. So uh, I think it can have an impact if it's done well. Um, but yeah, Twitter is not, as Paula said, is not where you're going to get those people. It's Snapchat and Instagram and, and those sort of things and Facebook. Yeah. Just, just a couple of quick ones. One is that you're absolutely right. While Twitter, while Twitter doesn't penetrate with the public at large, it does help form a narrative at Westminster yeah. between parties and journalists, and that inevitably has knock-on consequences in terms of coverage in papers and broadcast and all that. And then the other one, I was actually throwing back to you guys, really. Um, I noticed a big difference between 2017 and 2019 in my own family WhatsApp groups and my family Facebook. So my, all my in-laws are in Burnley and Lancashire and the majority of my family are on the west coast of Scotland, so two quite distinct places geographically. And they would share a lot of stuff with me. And I, what I wondered, I guess, is how much of that is organic stuff that's just emerging from their communities and their friends that they're putting together? And how much stuff you, you, both of the parties were sort of targeting geographically to local Facebook groups, which then get picked up and, and spread? Well, uh, I was actually going to say earlier, I, I thought the inter one of the interesting things was the mention of YouTube, which is complete, completely right. I mean, I remember, like, you know, the, the Tories basically took over YouTube. Um, I mean, as, as far as I can remember, they, they, you know, so everyone, everyone going to the site got the, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a case of, mm. of niche targeting. It was just like we're going to make sure that everyone sees this. I mean, you know, things like the video of the, um, you know, the arguing about arguing um, mm. video with this incredibly gravelly voiced uh, um, Tory staffer who was employed to do the voiceover and probably has, had, would have a, a, a fine career in that if he if he wanted to do it professionally. Yeah. Um, uh, Andrew, sorry. 
Um, <laughs> we, we, uh, and Philip Cowley, spe the spectre of Philip Cowley remains in this room. We've all read the article he wrote, I'm sure, saying how did this election happen. But we've seen, you know, as Rob and Paul have shown us the graphs of where you were in the polls in the run-up to the election in September and October. What were you thinking? Why did you agree to the election being called? So, just before you, you answer, Paul, even though you were late, and if the question's not for Andrew... All right. Forgive me for being late. It's kind of a busy news day with a certain tragedy going on. Um, uh, my question is one that you... Uh, forgive me if you've already been asked this, uh, and it's largely to the academics. Some Labour MPs uh, have come to me with a crumb of comfort since 2019, suggesting that actually, in the red wall seats, it wasn't Labour voters so much switching as staying at home. Now, as I say, that's a crumb of comfort, and I don't know if there's any data to back it up, and it'd be really nice to know whether you've got come to any firm conclusions on that. Should we give Andrew a moment, you two go first? I can take that one. What do you want to take that one? You, you go. You go. Uh, so I think, I think that is partly right, and what we've seen... So we don't talk about turnout in the book because we didn't have the data to really look at it and get into it in the book. But some of the analysis I've done elsewhere shows that we're seeing some different trends in turnout between those um, very liberal Labour voters and the less liberal Labour voters. So the liberal Labour voters, turnout amongst those groups hasn't really shifted very much since about 92. Amongst the less liberal Labour voters, that started to be more staying at home, much much lower turnout amongst those groups, and that's really opened up, but opened up since about 2010. Now I think the chat, the, the, so for the Labour MPs coming to you for crumbs of comfort, I'm not sure they're necessarily there, because there's no guarantee that if you turn those voters out, they're going to vote Labour, because their other characteristics suggest that voters like them actually voted Conservative. So you've got to win them back, not just make them turn out. Uh, and if I can add uh, a couple of other crumbs of discomfort uh, for the Labour MPs raising this point. Uh, a first is the aforementioned Brexit, you might not have been there for that, Paul, uh, but the, the Brexit Party effect. Obviously the Brexit Party stood in all of Labour's seats and uh, of course we shouldn't rule out the possibility of, uh, you know, uh, another uh, Farage-related vehicle being a prominent feature of the next election. With, with Nigel Farage, you really can't ever rule that kind of thing out. Um, but assuming that they're polling like Reform UK are right now, then that's a substantial section of the electorate that's most likely to go into the Tory column if it goes anywhere. Um, the second crumb of discomfort is for a number of elections now, indeed going back to the years of... Um, uh, David and Dennis, there has been an, a noticeable first-term incumbent effect. First-term incumbent MPs get a bonus. They do better. One of the reasons Labour lo lost virtually no seats in 2001 was that. Uh, and in all of those red wall seats that Labour has lost, you've now got a first-term Conservative incumbent who can build up a personal vote that will act as a cushion against any national swing against Labour. So, yes, I, I, I bring bad tidings at Christmas for the <laughs> Labour MPs looking for comfort. Andrew, on the election. Actually, I should say to you, if you're interested in that question about the election, on our Brexit archive on our website, there are some fascinating insights. And it's not just a Labour issue, it's an SNP issue. It's, I mean, and the Lib Dem issue, obviously. Uh, but there was an awful lot going on at the same time around then, so I don't think you can boil it down to Labour, but Andrew. Um, yeah, perhaps you can come in on this as well then. <laughs> um, my recollection, sorry, I'll do it this way so I can kind of at least look at you while I'm still speaking into the microphone, is that the SNP and the Liberal Democrats had said, at least, that they were going to vote for an election anyway at that point, and therefore there was the majority there for the two-thirds with that. Um, let, leave aside for a second whether Labour could hold a whip on anything by that point anyway to keep all Labour MPs voting the same way. Um, I think as well the other point that Labour had made in, you know, as the Tories would have seen it delaying the election by that point, was not until no deals off the table. Well, in effect, no deal had been off the table because you know, a deal had passed in the Commons. So, in, in a sense, narratively, I don't think we could have... Done, I mean, even if, for some reason, the Lib Dems and SNP had flaked away and not said what they were going to do, uh, or not done what they were going to do, um, I think there becomes a point where it would damage our credibility anyway, even further, um, if we had, for no apparent reason, and with no kind of uh, comfort blanket, if you like, kind of gone, no, we still don't want an election, even though that's now off the table. I just think going into an election subsequent to that 
would have damaged us even more, if you like. So um, I think it had. To, I don't think you go into an election saying I don't want it and we'd rather not be having it. I think you go into it saying yes, we can beat the Tories, even if behind the scenes you're not as confident as you might be on that. I think, I think my question is better. But I think my uh, for the, I think my question is better put to the Lib Dems, which I find genuinely it's a baffling, yeah. baffling decision. But, but I mean, the, because they all, in effect they authorise it, the SNP couldn't authorise it on their own for the politics of that, and I think it is. But, but, uh, I, I think the real counterfactual here is, is actually what happens if Boris doesn't get a Brexit deal. I think at that point the 2019 election becomes a lot more exciting um, in in a whole range of ways. We've time for probably one, uh, Tony, and we'll do those two because you're near each other, so geography works. Uh, excellent event uh, for all of us. There's been some evidence, I think, in uh, the studies after 2010 that the minority ethnic vote in Britain has been shifted or becoming more plural, i.e. less likely to vote Labour and slightly more likely to vote Conservative. Was that true in 2019? Was there a, a greater willingness to vote Conservative or less likely to vote Labour amongst minority voters? Can you just pass the mic back? Thank you. Um, so just one final question. So you're, you're looking at that like two-dimensional chart you had up, Paula. Um, it looks like where people sit on issues drove the vote. When you talk about Brexit, where people sit on issues chose the vote. When you looked at the impact of Jeremy Corbyn you, and, and certainly Boris, you thought it might be driven by Brexit and where people sit on issues. So what happened to competence and valence? And does that matter for the future um, with respect to what the government does now and the next election? Uh, well, I've plugged my own past work. I've plugged my PhD students' work. It's now my chance to plug my wife's work. Um, <laughs> because, uh, my, my wife, Maria Sobolewska, is the author of the definitive book on ethnic minority voting behaviour. <laughs> so speaking on her behalf, I would say um, that on the whole, the evidence for this is still very weak and the reasons for scepticism are still very strong. Uh, what Maria has found consistently in her work on this issue is that ethnic minorities line up with the Labour Party for reasons that are a lot to do with what they aren't rather than what they are. In essence, most ethnic minority groups in Britain still regard the Conservative Party with a degree of suspicion as a party that ultimately will not put their interests first if it comes to the crunch. I don't think anything that we have seen in the past few years is liable to change that. There is one exception and caveat I would make to this, which is uh, British voters of Indian heritage, where one does see uh, a tendency towards that group being more in play. But that is also not actually a new phenomenon. It's evident in earlier polling as well, and can indeed be traced back to an often forgotten um, element of British migration history, which is a substantial portion of that group, including our current Home Secretary, are here because of decisions of a Conservative government. So that group has a rather different attitude towards the Conservative Party and its views of minorities than many of the other VAME groups. So I'll try and take this kind of values and, and valence question. So one of the things I sometimes say when I give talks on um, political values is that if political science had been more interested in values and less interested in valence in 2015, the referendum might not have been such a surprise to them. Um, so that's, that's a flippant answer, but it's the best one I've got. <laughs> the other thing, though, that I would stress a bit more seriously is that these things are not entirely separate. So if you look at the influence of values on leader images, pe people's images of party leaders are very much influenced by their values and whether or not they feel those leaders share their values. So I don't, with, as with so many things in, this, in, this, in these stories of elections, trying to separate them completely is, is absolutely futile. But I do think that the pendulum, pe well, I can't say that word, but you know what I mean, um, had swung too far towards valence during the period from maybe 2001 to 2010. And now we might even be seeing it swing back too far the other way. But, but I, think, I think that was, um, yeah, sorry, I've lost my train of thought completely now. Um, but I think these two things go together in ways that we need to understand more. 
Do any of you three want to come in on either of these questions? You don't have to. Uh, I've got, I've got the, the, the only thing I'd say is, um, I, I just, just as a journalist, rather than um, having done this, I remember covering the, um, the Modi rally at, when, when Modi played Wembley Stadium. And Cameron introduced him, and you could see Cameron walking off stage with the smug grin of a man who thought 40,000 40, votes in the bag. Like there is very, there is very clearly a a, Tor, a a Tory Indian connection thing, and it goes it goes to you know, like the, the the people like the nature of the MPs and candidates and the, the, the and the party it's, it, itself. I think there's a really I mean even if it's not showing up in the voting data, like there is there is a really strong connection there. I think now. I have to say that wasn't exactly how my family WhatsApp group reacted, but. Um... <laughs> So there's, there's loads and loads and loads of questions on the Slido around this. I'm gonna, I'm just because we've got to finish up, because I think we're, we're running over. And in a sense, it, it, I'm, I'm just, the academics are going to hate this. It basically, the basic question is, was 2019 a Johnson success or a Corbyn failure? If you had to pick one or the other. And there's, there's so many questions around this theme that I'm not going to ask them all. But if I were to ask you to choose one driving variable behind this out of those two. I know you hate it, but try um, yeah, I would reiterate that the question is, is bad and you should feel bad <laughs> asking it as a fellow academic. Um, I, I, if forced to choose, as indeed you are forcing me to choose, I would, I would say Johnson's success rather than Corbyn failure simply for the reason that an awful lot of what led to Corbyn being in a worse position in 2019 was really very structural and kind mm -hmm. of out of his control. Now one of course can point to that as partly also being a failure of leadership, but you're forcing me to choose and not caveat, so that's that's all I can say. But we are selling your book. Paul, do you want to go or you can just I'm gonna say I wouldn't necessarily pick either on their own because of the long term trends that were underpinning both of them. So both both of those leaders ended up where they did as the product of long-term change, and so therefore pinning it on one or the other seems a little bit unfair. That's a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you meant to say? Yes. <laughs> Is that not just for the academics? No, no, no. Uh, no. It, was, it was a punishment for the academics, but you all get a go to. Um, no, I like Rob's approach of deconstructing the question. I think that's much more important. Um, but, I mean, look, I think it was more of a I probably would if I was going to come down on it more of a Johnson success um, but I totally agree with Paul I think and it, uh, I think often we talk too much in politics about personalities I'm, I'm, not, I'm conscious there are a lot of lobby journalists in the room who um, whose job relies on that and a lot of people on Twitter myself included who um, rely on that as well uh, too much um, but actually politics you know political shifts are structural and over time I mean I think if you look at Conservative voting trends since 1997. You look at Labour voting trends since 1997. They've been on pretty, you know, kind of continuous paths in opposite directions, unfortunately. Um, and you know, I'm not convinced that you know changing the leader um, has huge effect. I'm not saying it has none, obviously. Um, but there are structural problems that have to be overcome and can't be done by putting a new person in a suit for whichever party. Um, and I think how you address those. Um, changing electoral demographics um, within and geographics, sort of really, um, within the British electoral system is a huge challenge, especially for Labour, given how concentrated mm -hmm. its vote is at the moment in particular kind of urban yeah. settings. Um, so, given I said governments win elections uh, rather than oppositions, <laughs> I obviously have to say Johnson's success. That said, I, I obviously think I mean, Corbyn contributes to the scale of the victory. But um, taking P Pippa's advice to throw things forward, um, to, uh, I think. The fact, like Johnson's success, is it's not just a dry fact about 2019. It's it's something which is very important in understanding the modern Tory party. That like this felt to the Tories like a victory which was achieved only because of the unique personal, co the unique coalition that Boris and Brexit welded together for the party. This in this expansion of its influence. You know, it, it's like only Boris. You know, maybe any Tory voter who was committed to Brexit could have won an election, but only Boris could have won it in this way. And I think you see at the most recent party conference that there is still that halo around. Him. He is still the person who delivered that victory and therefore deserves his chance, which is why I think quite a lot of the conversation about the leadership is, is massively overblown, because like it, there, there's still that, that gratitude for him for, for getting this, this shock victory. I mean, the, 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 I, remember, like, I, mean I, I don't think Isaac joined in, but at, um, you know, when, when Sedgefield was won and someone played Things Can Only Get Better on the, on the tannoy in CCHQ at about, about two in the morning, like that, was, you know, that moment still kind of 
reverberates within the, within the Tory party. All I'd say is that the things, this is um, ultimately an academic event, so I think uh, I should pass over to you, Anand, and see what you think. <laughs> well, on that note, we seem to have run out of... <laughs> for which I apologise. We've actually run over. Uh, let me thank the British Academy for hosting this. Let me apologise again to them, those people who are watching online for the problems we had with the stream. Let me thank the panellists, Rob, Paula, Andrew, Robert and Pippa. I think you've been fantastic. Let me impress upon you that the price of admission was that you go and buy the book, which is on the table outside now. It's the least you can do. But I want to thank, I want to end by thanking you all because this might make me a weirdo, but it has been so fantastic to be in a room and to do this in person with a live audience. I've loved every minute of it. I hope you have too. And I hope we can do it again soon. Thank you all. Thank you.